back again um, at this conference and now I can't say it's great to be back in San Diego since I live here um, and so uh, and it's also nice to be able to change my affiliation to be back here at Rady Children's Hospital and so I have the obligatory slide of the hospital that that I'm at now and so it was fun to get to change this down to palm trees and, and sun And it always works out that I give this talk either right after breakfast or right after lunch. In this case, we'll have it a little bit over the lunch hour here. So the objectives for the talk is to have a, a good understanding of how common is constipation and, and soiling in children. And specifically, we'll look a little bit at, at how common this is in children with uh, Jacobson syndrome. And then I'll spend some time talking about why children develop constipation and then move on to some uh, treatment options for, for constipation. And we'll keep it at, at sort of a very uh, global approach to constipation. And then I think if you have specific questions, um, uh, what, what has worked out well is that uh, uh, Dr. Grossfeld has been keeping track of the bulletin board and has forwarded me questions uh, over the bulletin board or from the bulletin board that I've been able to then respond back directly to you. Um, you can also email me back uh, through uh, the Rady Children's Hospital email. I didn't put that on here, but it's ntipness at rchsd.org. So first initial, last name at rchsd.org. It may take a couple of days for me to get back to you uh, through the email, but that's a good way to, to reach out to me as well. So let's look at how common is constipation. And when you look at children with special needs, it, it's actually the most common uh, GI problem that, that they present with. And, and in a survey uh, done uh, back in 1999 looking at, at children with uh, cerebral palsy, 75% of those children had chronic constipation. So it's, it's a big problem. And then also eating disorders can be a big issue as well. Um, I think that looking at some data that we had collected a couple years ago, we looked at, at feeding issues and, and overall swallowing disorders wasn't a leading indicator in children with Jacobson syndrome. Certainly um, behavioral uh, and feeding time related problems but was also a, a, the second most common issue uh, from a GI standpoint faced with children with uh, uh, Jacobson syndrome. So looking specifically at children with Jacobson syndrome with, with uh, uh, not, not, not Paul Goldsfeld, but a different uh, doctor found that 42% uh, of kids with uh, Jacobson syndrome had uh, constipation. What was interesting is that there was a higher frequency of pyloric stenosis reported in this, this age group. And when you look at how sphincters work, so, so the, the pylorus is, is a sphincter valve, they all seem to have sort of the same issue with how these sphincters open up and relax, and that they're, they're driven by a, a compound called uh, nitric oxide. And so in, in infants that have issues with nitric oxide, uh, they tend to develop this, this uh, uh, growth of the pyloric sphincter muscle where it doesn't open up and relax well and you get the symptom called, called pyloric stenosis. And that same chemical is also involved in relaxation of the anal sphincter and this may be a more long-term issue that, that, that other researchers are looking at in other children and, and maybe this may play a role in Jacobson syndrome as well. So when you, when you look at the frequency of what's normal for stooling, it varies by age. Young infants uh, tend to poop more frequently. Uh, it can be up to 10 or 11 times a day, and that's considered uh, normal. And then gradually, as you get older, that frequency of stooling drops down to where it's in the one to two bowel movement range, uh, really by uh, the early childhood period. When you look at what is the definition of constipation, there's been some consensus that's developed by a group called the Rome Group. And what they found was that constipation really is defined as the difficulty of passing stool, decreased, decreased frequency of stool passage, and by definition they, they have decided that less than three bowel movements per week is considered constipation when you look just purely at the frequency of stool passage. And they also look at the increased size of the stool and then increased hardness of the stool. And actually part of their criteria is if you have a stool that clogs the toilet, even if it's just once in a blue moon, that's considered constipation as well. 
So soiling or enchropesis, on the other hand, is described as an involuntary loss of formed, semi-formed or liquid stool into the underwear uh, without an organic cause after the age of toilet training. So we really can't make this diagnosis until about age two or three. And when psychogenic encopresis can be the voluntary passage of whole stool into the underwear or an unorthodox location. So there are some children that will poop like in a plant or in their backyard um, because it's a more psychogenic problem. So if they just lose it, um, if, they, if they just soil um, into their underwear, it's really usually not a psychogenic process. So in reality, this is what we're trying to avoid when we manage constipation. And now we'll start looking at some factors of why does constipation happen. So in order to poop, really, you have to have these four things. One, the stool has to be soft in consistency. And we have medications and dietary management that we can use to address that issue. And, it, and it's actually becoming more clear that in some patients that can never get off stool softeners, there may be a primary defect in, in the transporter um, uh, protein complex in the lining of the small bowel and colon that actually regulates fluid going in. In adults, they, what they found using tissue sample uh, biopsies in a research setting, there's actually a defect in the chloride transmitter, which is uh, similar to the transporter that's involved with cystic fibrosis. And so using a hormone medication that can actually upregulate the work of the, the, the function of this chloride transporter and generate uh, loose stools. Unfortunately, that medication has, even though it's commercially available now, has a lot of side effects. And particularly in children, in the studies that were done, they found that they had more side effects than Miralax did. So most people are opting to stay on, on Miralax medication. But actually, it's a good target. So I think in the future, they'll target um, this, this transporter um, more accurately. And there may be a role for research where we can go in and, and do biopsies and actually um, sequence that, that transporter um, at the tissue level. But that's still way too early to use that as a target. But I think it explains why some kids have, have um, trouble maintaining a soft stool. Then you have to have the signal to actually, or reflex to generate a bowel movement. And so there's, there's two reflexes that are involved in this. One is called the gastrocolonic reflex. And that's the reflex that when you eat food, you have the urge to go to the bathroom shortly after you, you eat. And some people, that can be strong enough that even if you think about food, that generates the urge to have a, a bowel movement as well. And then the second reflex is the orthoclonic reflex, which is a reflex that when you wake up from sleep, you have to go to the bathroom. Normally, when you're sleeping, your colon falls asleep as well. Otherwise, you'd be pooping in the middle of the night, and that can be really, really inconvenient. Um, <laughs> So the third thing that has to happen is that you have to have adequate colonic contractions to move the stool through your colon. And we'll talk a little bit about that um, in some uh, future slides. And then the last thing is you have to open up the door to let the stool out. So that's where the sphincter valve relaxing and, and opening up to let the poop out is important. And if it doesn't happen, it would be the equivalent of us trying to leave this room with the doors closed. So you can, you can overcome this by charging the door and knocking the door off the hinges. And your colon actually does that in some cases where, where it contracts hard enough and strong enough to, to actually overcome the strength of that sphincter valve and let the poop out. But as you can imagine, that can be really, really painful. And that's when you see kids that are crying and straining and grunting to try to get their stool out. They're actually not letting the door open um, adequately to let the poop out. And we'll talk a little bit about that and how we can assess that. Um, manometrically. So when you look at medical causes of constipation, um, they really fall into different categories, altered anatomy, and there's some, some things that we can see on, on physical exam to look at, at whether the anus is in the right place, whether it actually is open, and whether there's um, tumors like a, like a sacral teratoma. Um, that could uh, cause and impact the anatomy of the, the anal sphincter area. And so with a good exam, we can identify that pretty closely. And then there are some uh, neuro neurogenic pathos, uh, uh, causes, uh, spinal cord abnormalities. And again, we can pick this up on physical examination by looking at anal reflexes and whether there's you know, physical deformation of the, the lower spine. And then in children with cerebral palsy, there's actually impaired nerves uh, coming into that area of nerve function. 
Uh, there's certain uh, nerve and muscle disorders. Uh, Hirschsprung's disease is um, the typical uh, nerve muscle disorder. Uh, and a condition called intestinal pseudo-obstruction where the nerve and the muscle in the colon the small, small bowel is not uh, working well. And then there's a whole list of, of things that can alter the physiology, uh, drugs, hormones, uh, imba endocrine imbalances, uh, and, and toxins. Then there can be uh, uh, functional causes of constipation where it's not related to an underlying condition. And these typically are situational uh, uh, issues that come up, dietary uh, issues, and then developmental issues. So when you look at situational causes of, of constipation, um, it's quite common that when you get a, a febrile illness or a prolonged illness, you're, you're not eating and drinking as well, you have losses of fluid due to diarrhea or vomiting, and that can lead to situational constipation. Usually if you can remedy that and get them get the kids back into their normal diet, uh, they go back to a normal stooling pattern. Um, I talk about anal fissures and diaper dermatitis. That's irritation right around the rectal area, and that can lead to a withholding process because, again, that's a painful thing, and so the children are good at avoiding things that hurt them, and so they'll, they'll try to withhold stooling. Uh, medications, so uh, a common medication uh, or a common condition that has um, medications that lead to constipation is ADHD. So many of those uh, medications have constipation as a side effect. Um, and so I see constipation in a lot of uh, those children. And then also excessive interventions. And so we have some kids that get frequent um, uh, rectal uh, uh, examinations or interventions that are done. And because they're, they're trying to avoid that um, intervention, they actually withhold stool from that as well. And then lifestyle. So it's a busy life now, trying to uh, uh, juggle uh, work and, and school, uh, making uh, mornings and mealtimes very hectic, and so that can, can also lead to uh, problems with constipation. From a diet standpoint, inadequate fluid is, is very common. Um, in my practice now, I've really pushed uh, fluid. And, and the lack of fluid not only provides a way for the stool to dry out, but also affects nerve function as well. And so there is more evidence now that kids have autonomic dysfunction where the, the nerve pathways that actually control the colon um, are, are essentially getting dehydrated. And so the hydration not only helps keep fluid in the stool, but also helps keep good, good nerve function. And salt may actually play a role in this as well, where you need some salt to actually keep the fluid in the body itself and keep the fluid in, in the nerves. Um, and then uh, with diet, low fiber as well. So in, in kids that aren't getting a well-balanced diet, their fiber intake can be low. And so they're, they're not maintaining the proper amount of bulk to keep fluid in the stools. And last, I'll mention uh, some developmental uh, issues. Um, so both cognitive and physical hand handicaps play a role in both the ability to recognize the need to go to the bathroom and then to be able to follow through and actually go through all the motions that you need to go through in order to, to relax the right muscles to, to develop a bowel movement. Also, the delayed acquisition of motor skills play a role as well because you're not able to physically maneuver and relax the muscles to, to generate a bowel movement. There may be some issues with genetic predisposition and that it can uh, lead to uh, clonic inertia and, sl and sluggish bowel and also lead to uh, feeding uh, difficulties where you're not able to uh, take in enough fluid to maintain hydration. And then when you look at psychogenic issues, that can also play a role. And so for some kids, it can be a way to avoid situations that can be very um, troubling to them, like going to school. Um, but these are psychologic conditions that all uh, play a role in, um, in uh, stooling avoidance uh, in, in some children. So when you look specifically at children with special needs, um, there are some factors that play a role. Many of these children are not ambulatory, and so they don't have 
great abdominal tone and abdominal massage that happens um, as you're moving around and that can affect uh, the movement of the colon. Uh, their fluid and fiber intake, poor coordination, medications, and then also other comorbid factors. So this is one of my favorite things, how can you tell that you need to go, and moms always know best. So then when you look at what's the role of constipation and soiling, there's this uh, cycle that develops where you get an initiating event that leads to constipation. And that results in the child withholding stool. And the rectum begins to adjust to this larger stool mass that's there. And as the volume increases, the stool dries out. And the stool becomes more difficult to pass. So the child then gets back into withholding. And eventually, you get fecal overflow. And so schematically, this is what this looks like. You take this normal colon. You start to accumulate stool. You get this uh, stretching of the colon that then results in a megacolon. And if you can get this passage of stool out, eventually the colon gets back down to a normal size, and then you get normal re recurrence of function. So that's the goal of therapy, is to keep the colon, uh, and especially the lower colon, free of stool, so that way you have the normal muscle function in place and, and hopefully normal stooling. So what's my approach to this? And first, it's important to get a complete picture. And so when I see patients in the office, I'll spend a lot of time looking at their history of constipation and what are the other factors that are involved with uh, causing them to develop constipation. They'll have a physical exam, and based on the exam, we can tailor a diagnostic approach to look at you know, these, these factors. Uh, are their colons having a normal uh, reflex response to, to develop these contraction waves? Um, are the contraction waves going through all the way uh, through the colon and whether they're opening the door properly. And then we can uh, uh, offer treatment for this. So I already alluded to with the history, uh, talking about you know, when and how did it start, um, what treatments have been used before, if there's any factors in the family that, that may predispose somebody to having constipation and uh, from an environmental standpoint or other things that are contributing. And then looking at uh, medications and diet history as well. So on the exam, I'm looking at a general assessment of their growth. And I do a, a complete physical exam, including a rectal evaluation. And what I'm looking for are whether there's any skin tags or fissures that may imply other medical conditions that could be present. Uh, whether the reflexes are there, and just physically is the rectum in the normal location. Um, in some children, that rectum could be displaced or moved more anteriorly, so towards the, the, the pubic bone in the front, and that uh, alters the anatomy of the rectum and causes you to essentially have to poop around a corner. And so then you're not able to expel the stool very efficiently. Um, so diagnostically, some of the common tests that I'll do is just a, a regular x-ray uh, of the abdomen, both in a frontal view, but then also from a side view, so we can get a, a view of, of the, um, you know, what's in the rectum and what's the actual uh, anatomy of the, rec uh, of the rectal area to see if there's um, uh, an abnormality with the uh, direction at, at which the stool is coming out. I may do some metabolic testing to look at thyroid function, to look at electrolytes, to look at kidney function, and then if indicated, we can do a lead test. Usually that's part of routine uh, screening uh, during the first five years of life, and so um, if I know that that's normal, then, then I, I don't order that test. And then I'll do some tests to look at function, and so right now there's a test that we can do called a SITSMART test, and I'll show you what that test is uh, later on in the talk, but it lets us look at whether uh, contents are moving through the colon in a normal way or not. And if it's not, then by definition you have something called slow transit constipation. And what I found in a group of children with slow transit constipation, about half of them had an identifiable problem with the colon that we could remedy either with surgery or changing um, their medication regimen around. So it's a really nice test to do. And eventually we're going to have some other uh, better non-invasive tests to look at a uh, colonic function that can really look at the whole bowel itself to see if things are moving through well. 
Anal rectal manometry is a technique that we use to look at the function of the rectum itself in the anal sphincter to see if it's functioning normally, and then colon manometry. And there is a role to do biopsies to look at the physical muscle and nerve itself, and that's to look for Hirschsprung's disease. And some of these other tests actually are, are useful screening tools to see really if we need to go to that ultimate test, the, the rectal biopsy. So here's an x-ray. This is a kid with a huge, massive uh, uh, rectal fecal impaction. And um, you can see the outline of the air in the stool here. And, and there's just no way that that's going to get out without some type of intervention. So it's helpful for us to screen for a, a fecal impaction without having to necessarily do a digital rectal exam. The SITSMARC test is a, another x-ray based test where you, you have to swallow capsule or if you can't swallow a capsule you can open up the capsule and, and ingest uh, these 24 radio opaque markers. And they're about the size of a SpaghettiO so they're really really pretty small. And then you get an x-ray three or five days later depending on your age and we look at the distribution of these markers to assess whether the transit's slow or if it's normal and also whether there's an outlet obstruction at the, at the anal sphincter where you're not able to relax the sphincter and get the markers out. So this uh, x-ray here is an example of a child with uh, pelvic outlet obstruction. And what you see here is that all of these markers are down in the lower abdomen where the rectum is. And so you can tell that they're not opening up the sphincter well to let the stool out. And we can either treat that with either physical therapy where we can try to train the children to relax their pelvic muscles or gluteal muscles to allow them to stool. Or in some cases, what I've done is actually injected a medication called Botox. So most of you are familiar with that for cosmetic purposes, but it actually relaxes the anal sphincter and prevents you from um, contracting that to uh, prevent stool from coming out. And so that's another approach that's been very helpful in children. The x-ray here on the right is an example of a child with constipation. And what you see is that all the markers are being held in the, um, the right side of the colon. So this is a child that I'm very worried about, that they may have an abnormal functioning colon, and, and they may need to have some type of intervention to, to get that colon to work better. And usually by the time that they've seen me, we've already tried laxative therapy, and so it's most likely that this child's going to need surgery once we can define exactly where the abnormality is. So the way that we do that is through a technique called manometry testing. And what we're doing with manometry testing is that we're measuring the pressure and the coordination of contractions through the colon to see if the colon is contracting in a normal way to let the, the stool pass through. So this is an example of what we look for in somebody that's normal. And what we see are these very high amplitude contractions moving through in a very stepwise fashion through the colon um, to indicate that that function is normal and it should get down really to the last part of the colon, the rectal colon, uh, the rectum itself and then we know that from the rectum that contracts to expel it separately. Here's an example of somebody with an abnormal test and what we see in this patient is that the contraction waves are only going through the very first part of the colon but then really it's not getting through the rest of the colon itself and so that last half of the colon is not functioning correctly. And so this is a patient that if we've tried medication therapy and physical therapy and they've not gotten better, then we would move on to a surgical approach. With the anal rectal manometry, what, what I'm looking for is uh, what is the uh, pressure that's being generated in the anal you know, sphincter itself. And we have some fancier uh, catheters than what's seen here, but the principle is, sa is the same. We use a balloon to, uh, to distend the rectum and then to simulate stool coming down into the rectum. Then we look at the relaxation spawn, response of the, the anal canal itself. And there's really um, uh, four different patterns that we see. The first one is normal where the anal sphincter relaxes and allows the stool uh, to go through uh, in response to the balloon uh, being distended. Um, and we see these here uh, in, in these two pictures here. Um, and in, a, in a children that have a condition called dysinergia, what we see is that in response to 
uh, the distension of the um, of the uh, uh, rectum with air. Uh, instead of seeing this relaxation, initially what we see is this big spike in pressure uh, where they're actually squeezing that rectum tight and closed, trying to prevent the stool from coming out. And then it may or may not relax after that, depending on how good they are at, at squeezing their, their rectum tight. So if they're really, really strong and they've, they've essentially developed uh, you know, bicep, you know, huge bicep-sized types of uh, anal sphincter muscles, um, you may not actually see a relaxation, relaxation there. Um, but in others where it's just a brief uh, contraction, then you'll see a relaxation afterwards. So if we don't see the relaxation, th this is a child that I would think about, you know, could they have a short segment Hirschsprung's disease where the muscle isn't uh, innervated by nerves and they're not relaxing the sphincter. And so then I would send them for a biopsy. Um, or um, here's an example of a patient with, with true Hirschsprung's disease uh, where again you see this pattern where they, they contract the sphincter instead of uh, allowing it to relax at the beginning and then you don't see this drop in pressure that's there. And so again, I would uh, send this patient for a biopsy. So it's a helpful test to decide whether they really need to have you know, more surgical type management for um, their constipation. Last, sometimes we'll do endoscopy as well to look for inflammation in the colon. And then to get this biopsy where we're looking for the nerve cells here, this is an example of, an, of a ganglion cell, the nerve cell, cell down in the rectum itself. And in this patient, that ganglion cell isn't really developed very well. And so that's what we're looking for in the biopsies. So treatment. So treatment really um, is a combination of clearing out the old stool that's there, because all the treatments don't actually soften the stool that's already hard. All it does is make the new stool that you're making soft. And so unless you get rid of the hard plug of stool, you're essentially um, defeating the purpose of your treatment. And that's why I think a lot of kids fail treatment, is that that, that rectal fecal impaction isn't being recognized, and so they're just not able to get the cork out so the wine doesn't flow out uh, through their, their rectum. The poop doesn't come out. Then education and support to, to help families deal with the behaviors that are associated with chronic constipation. And then a maintenance regimen um, uh, to keep their stool soft and to help the colon work as efficiently as possible. And the last, I always like to try to wean laxative therapy um, uh, so we can try to get them on the minimal amount of therapy that's needed. And for some kids, it's, it's a, you know, once a weekend type of uh, sort of mini um, treatment just to kind of get rid of the backlog of stool that's built up over the, the course of the week, and, and that might be the best that we can do. So disimpaction therapy is, is really important. So this is a, a, a very old enema device here. Luckily, we don't need to use these anymore. Um, but straight from the sanitarium uh, is this enema device here. Um, and what was neat about this is that it was actually portable, so you could take it with you on your trips. And uh, the tip here is actually made out of ivory, so it was made out of uh, um, elephant tusk at that time. So the goal of the therapy is to dislodge the rectal impaction. And I actually like to use mineral oil as sort of a pre-lubricant to help make the stool slide out more easily. Um, so I'll have the kids take that for a couple of days beforehand, and then I'll, I'll go, have them go through the, the purge itself. Um, I keep milk of, milk of molasses on here, um, although this is something that has really shouldn't be used anymore. And it's a reminder to me to tell everyone that if your doctor recommends that, you should say no. And the reason for that is that the, the molasses that's there is fermented by the bacteria that's in the stool itself. And there's actually been some deaths reported because of tremendous gas buildup that occurs and causes colonic perforation that's there. And so now the, the North American Pediatric GI Society actually um, has taken, off, taken that out of their, their recommendation uh, for treatment of constipation. And then after you soften and you get rid of the rectal impaction that's there, uh, what you want to do is purge the stool from the colon. And so Miralax is still my biggest uh, fan, favorite uh, medication to use. We can use it in doses like we would use for colon cleanouts for colonoscopy. And that works pretty well. 
but you may need to add a stimulant in there to get the colon to contract very efficiently and actually move the stool out. Um, you can use Fleet's Phosphosoda, uh, but you have to be worried about side effects due to um, what's happening for, from an electrolyte balance standpoint. And so in kids that have renal disease, um, you know, this, this would be a toxic medication for them. Then uh, mag citrate still used a lot, and the beauty of mag citrate is that you can get a small dose and get a big clean out from it. So um, uh, usually a f four ounces of mag citrate is enough medication to purge the entire colon out. So in a child that doesn't like to drink a lot, it's actually a good medication to use. It tastes terrible, so you have to really coax them to drink it and try to make it really cold, serve it on ice so that way it tastes better. Um, but again, four ounces versus you know a gallon of fluid, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a huge different in, difference in volume. And that being said, volume is critical. It's still important even though you're using a small amount of medication, like four ounces of mag citrate, that you get the kids to drink a lot during their clean out phase. And really the goal should be to get them to drink at least a quart of fluid after they've um, uh, taken the, the, the clean out medication. So behavior is important. So getting kids to sit on the toilet regularly is really, really important. And so I tell families it's important so that for the kids to be on a routine, to have them sit on the toilet twice a day. And then I also prescribe some medications or some uh, exercises uh, for them to do while they're on the toilet, to do abdominal breathing, where they learn how to squeeze their abdominal muscles to try to uh, generate a good bowel movement. It's important to uh, schedule regular bathroom breaks, especially when you're traveling, um, to, to be cognizant that the kids need to go to the, to the bathroom and to try to work that in their schedule. It may mean you know, getting back to the hotel room for a little bit in the afternoon uh, around a snack time so that way they can have that afternoon toilet sit in there. And if they're not better, then um, a lot of times we'll have to use counseling as well. And so uh, I've been working with the de developmental pediatricians here at, at uh, UC San Diego to help uh, provide some counseling for the kids um, to get them to understand both compliance with the medications but also with the need um, to, to sit on the toilet regularly. So at a certain point we have to say that they've had enough therapy and it's time to, to move on and get them off their, their fiber and laxatives. So um, typically what I recommend before taking them off their medications is that they really should have uh, two to three months of therapy where they're not having any problems at all. And then you know that their bodies are probably ready to be weaned. And you want to do a slow taper over several weeks to months, you know, looking at each interval change to see if they're having any rebound. Because if they're starting to rebound during the wean process, it's unlikely that they're going to succeed coming off medication completely. And during this time, you want to really make sure that, they're fo that the kids are focused on fluid and fiber, uh, because that'll be the bridge that actually gets them off of medication if they don't have an underlying problem with how their colon is working. And if they start to rebound, then you need to put them back on their, their best treated regimen to prevent that buildup of stool, to prevent the impaction and from essentially having to start over from, from ground zero. So in some cases, though, medication management doesn't really work. And so then we have to look at surgical management. And for some patients, it's actually a removal of part of the colon um, that's not functioning well that we can identify through manometry techniques um, to help them stool better. But there is a procedure that I really like to use, which is a, a procedure called a saccostomy tube, or you can actually put that into the sigmoid colon itself. And what that allows you to do is to actually do these anterograde enema techniques where you can actually flush the colon out that way. And you can actually do it on a schedule so that way you make it very predictable for the kids. Because usually if you have the regimen adjusted correctly, within 20 to 30 minutes of instilling the medication, you're going to have a, a, a clean out, um, essentially, of your, their colon. And so that way you can, you can keep the colon empty and then prevent them from having soiling accidents. And so what that saccostomy tube looks like internally is essentially a, a, a G-tube that's there. Eventually we can put a G-tube right into that, that lower part of the colon itself. So externally it looks like a button device, but internally it has an opening there that, they can, that you can use to, to purge the colon out. And, and while it seems like it's a pretty radical step that's there, one, it, it, when it works, 
it's really a good quality of life device because now you don't have to worry about you know if, um, uh, arranging your day around the child's bowel movements. Um, and also, and cosmetically, it, it sits very flush on the skin. So really, the only people that know about it is the child and the parent. So, so it gets the kids back into a normal social environment as well. So it's really a, a nice, nice device to use. So I just want to conclude that constipation is pretty common in children with special needs. And it's a really a multifactorial um, disorder. And so the treatment has to be individualized uh, to uh, use a combination of medications and behavioral strategies to minimize the risk of, of uh, and social risk of complication. And there are some nice emerging operative uh, strategies that are there. And actually, we're going to find some new diagnostic uh, strategies coming out probably in the next three or four years using some minimally invasive devices where you know, we can look at colonic function very nicely. Uh, without having to do invasive procedures to do that. So I think that that's something that, that probably two or three conferences from now I'll be able to talk about that in greater detail. So I'll take a few questions here because I'm, I'm sure that you guys have some specific questions. If not, you can feel free to email me as well. Okay. I got the microphone. I'm going to go ahead and ask one question on behalf of the, you know, the Spanish-speaking families. I hope I'm translating it. For me. But I think the question is basically, their daughter, uh, I think, has not been allowed to take Miralax because of constipation, but has she been taking it anyway for a couple of years? Yeah. And so just the question is, what are the safety issues and concerns about Miralax? Sure. And that's a good question because when you look at the FDA watch list, it's actually on the top 16 list of drugs that have had reports made to the FDA. And time and time again, the FDA has come out saying that the, the reports, um, and these are reports that, that anyone can generate, have not been associated with toxicity. So, so what this medication is, it's a, res, it's a resin that's uh, not absorbed by the body, and it's designed to osmotically hold water in, in the stool itself. So it's not absorbed at all. There's been some nice studies done in Europe where they've had children that have been on this medication for, for two to four years' time. That was the time frame they were looking at. And they could not detect this medication at all in the bloodstream of these children. And then they also looked at kidney and liver function, which are the two main mechanisms that our body clears chemicals out of our, our bodies. And they found that there were no derangements uh, that had, had changed from their baseline liver and kidney functions at that end of that two to four year period that the kids are on the medication. So it's pretty safe. What I have seen is that I've, I have seen some kids that develop allergic side effects where they get hives and rashes in response to the medication, but usually that's, that, you know, that's, a, true side, that's a true allergic response that's there. Uh, and it's usually due to the fillers that are in the medication. But I can, I can, I can name three kids um, out of a few thousand kids that I put on Miralax that actually had an allergy to it. So you're going to know within the first few doses whether or not that's, that's a problem. She can drink water. She can't drink water. She can't drink water. Yeah. Um, so she can't drink liquids. So, yeah. So, um, you know, you can, you can mix it in, in really in any fluid. You're going to absorb the nutrients from it, but you're not going to absorb the fluid itself. Um, so that's why you can mix it in milk. You'll still get the calcium and the vitamins out of the milk that it's in, but you're not going to just get the fluid out. So you need to, you know, increase or not count that eight ounces of hydration towards the total fluid needs for the day. But when I when I count when I count, you know, constipation hydration, it still counts towards that because it's fluid that's getting into your colon. We'll have. Time for a couple more questions? Sure. Mm -hmm. If not, uh, okay. <laughs> um, my question isn't exactly about constipation. It was about um, more like milk and whether or not you've seen any kids with chromosomal abnormalities have an intolerance to milk at a higher percentage than kids in the general population. Um. I don't see data, or I haven't come across data looking at the frequency of that. So, um, but I, but kids that there are kids that with chromosomal abnormalities that have underlying immune signaling 
that, that causes them to not tolerate milk as well. And so they really have sort of an allergy type uh, immune response to that. Now, we have some tested for milk allergies yeah. and did not have one. But when he drinks milk, there's a strange smell on his breath. And I really, I've never smelled it before. It doesn't happen with my other son. And so I think that in some way he might be intolerant to it. Have you yeah. ever heard of that? Yeah. And so when you look at how we manifest allergies, um, there's really four different pathways that we have to have an allergic response. And so the traditional allergy testing is IgE-based, and so that's what we test for with blood and skin testing is IgE-mediated med allergies. So it's not looking at the three other pathways. There is IgG testing that hasn't been really well validated, at least through traditional medicine techniques, um, but that's a that's the second pathway that we have allergic responses. And then there's two cell-mediated responses that we have to milk that, that we don't measure very well. Um, one we can measure through a technique called patch testing. And there's very few centers that can do it because it's actually a very difficult technique to use. Um, and it took about six years to get that in Milwaukee. We still don't have that here in San Diego because it's just that difficult of a technique to use. Um, and then there's some direct cell-mediated things where the only way we could test it would be to actually inject the thing into your colon and see if you develop an allergic response, and it's just not practical to do that. So, so to answer your question, it is possible to have an allergy to something even though you can't test for it. Okay. I mean, that's what's really, really, really frustrating is that you can be allergic and you just don't know. So when I talk to food allergists about it, what they say is that you know it's really the history that's important. So if you're exposed to something and you don't respond to it right, and that response goes away when you're not exposed, and you try it again, and the same thing happens, you're probably allergic to it. So it's a little common sense. Sure. Um, you had mentioned the use of mineral oil as a lubricant or whatever. Uh, we were with a ability to aspirate and all that, we mm -hmm. were always steered away from that. Has there been more data as far as that goes, or is there an alternative if there is an aspiration possibility? Sure. So certainly from an oral approach, if you're aspirating, you really shouldn't use mineral oil because of the, the risk of uh, pulmonary disease um, as a result of the aspiration. So then rectally, that's, that's the only other approach that you can do. And, and, and you can administer mineral oil rectally if you get one of those nasal aspirators. Um, you can suck it up into the suction ball and then squirt it in that way. And so, um, yeah, not something that you can do every day, obviously, and it's really meant for just the disimpaction itself to lubricate the stools um, that way um, and, and to use it during that phase. It's really not a good medication for daily use. I'm going to request that we go ahead and wrap it up now, and I know Neil is very happy to entertain more questions out there. The reason why we need to wrap this up is the child care people need to get their lunch break. So uh, for those parents that need to get back to their kids, this is the time. We will resume at 1.30, so about an hour from now, so people will still get lunch. Uh, so at 1.30, I'll get my talk on the cardiac issues, and then we will still be able to resume the uh, breakout sessions this afternoon. Thanks. Yeah, so I think next time.